This is just a moment in time. It's nothing when it comes to the, the big picture of life. Like you're struggling, everybody struggles. You're gonna get through this. You're going to be able to survive this. It's not that bad. Welcome to the Elevate Podcast. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for listening. This is episode 31. I am host Tyler Johnson. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Elevate Educate. This is a podcast for student athletes and those who coach them. Thank you for joining us. I have another amazing guest this week, this episode, whenever you are listening to this. Ethan is a staunch mental health and substance abuse prevention advocate dedicated to ending the stigma and spreading awareness. Certified by the National Council of Behavioral Health, Ethan's mental health first aid workshops teach participants to identify and assist people who may be in crisis. Ethan is the founder of a nonprofit organization that supports education and substance abuse prevention for students and student athletes. He's been featured in best-selling books. He has interviewed for other books, newspaper articles, and numerous podcasts, radio, and television appearances. Ethan uses his life story to illustrate the devastating consequences of mental health stigma and substance abuse while spreading a message of accountability and self-care. Welcome to the podcast, Ethan Fisher. Ethan, how are you? I'm good, Tyler. How are you? I am great. I'm excited to have you on. I'm excited to share the things that I know you are out there uh, sharing with the world and helping kids and adults and people um, with mental health and so many other things. But uh, for those that might not know you, I came across you just through, I think, the education world and saw some of your work that you were out there speaking and have followed you for a while. And uh, I recommend you do the same if you're listening to this podcast. We, we've got his social media linked up. But for those that don't really know too much about your story, um, can you share a little bit about it? I know that we could spend a long time, but um, uh, share briefly about uh, your story and how I know you're a high school successful athlete to the work you're doing now. I know yeah. it was a journey. Yeah, it, it definitely was a journey. Um, basketball obviously right now the nba and the bubble's going on so i'm in heaven right now uh this has been the best thing during this whole entire pandemic but when it comes to my basketball my career i've been playing basketball since i was a little kid and middle school was really that first time that you identify with things and so i took basketball as like that confidence builder i'm actually pretty good at this i can compete but i was tiny i was one of the smallest kids in school so i've always been you know, looked at as, oh, that's Ethan. He's just going to be this, you know, fun little basketball player, but never, they didn't know the drive I had. And so I went through middle school and played, you know, varsity basketball all the way through high school. Um, I didn't get to start varsity until my junior year. I had some attitude problems my sophomore year and they, they kept me on JV because I couldn't get my grades up. And I wish I would have seen that as a red flag because that ended up affecting the rest of my life. So once I got past high school, um, I ended up getting a scholarship to play my freshman year at Lamar Community College, a JUCO down in Southern Colorado. And I actually started every game, but like three or four due to academic issues. And before I realized it, I failed out after second semester, after I had scholarship offers at some pretty big schools, and then ended up going to another school, Eastern Wyoming, and coach and I didn't get along. I started drinking and partying even more than my last school, failed out. So I had to take another year off, go to another school. I went out to Butte Junior College in, in California, played for the best coach I've ever had. Unbelievable coach. I learned more from him in a couple months than I have all my college coaches combined. And I wish I would have handled my situation out there a lot better, but drugs, alcohol, academic stuff got in the way. Failed out of that school, got an opportunity the next year at Metro, failed out before I could even enroll because I was smoking and drinking and partying. And after Metro, I got an opportunity to play at UNC Greeley when they went division one. And so I actually played that year, 
up until second semester when I failed out again because of drugs and alcohol. And what actually is the underlying factor of all this stuff, and we're going to address it, is mental health. Mm. I've been dealing with depression and suicide since eighth grade. And along that journey of basketball, I'd been using alcohol and any substance I could get a hand on to deal with the pain. And so when I was at UNC, that was my last school in 2003, uh, I ended up waking up and finding out that I drunk drove and killed somebody after a house party. And so 2003 was uh, obviously probably the worst year of my life and ended up doing a lot of time and going through the prison system and, and after prison and boot camp and all these types of things, the love of bas basketball took over. And when I got out of prison, I ended up playing again at Johnson Wells uh, NAIA school. So I was a 28 year old ankle monitor wearing parolee playing college basketball with a bunch of 18, 19 year old kids. And uh, I just, the game, the game has always been good to me. I didn't treat it right. And, and that's the type of thing I try to, you know, speak to athletes about is you have this opportunity to do something and you have such a limited window and, when it's over, it's over. Um, but basketball has been, it's been the most significant thing in my life other than my family and, and, and really my faith in God. That's awesome. I know, uh, tell us, uh, uh, for those that don't know a little bit about the speaking and, and I know you, you touched on the mental health and, and um, part of that, um, but you're out speaking across the country to schools, educators, kids, student athletes. Um, what's the main message you take to those kids? So originally when I started, my main message was drunk driving prevention. You know, you, you think about all the high school kids and college students who drink and party every single weekend. And as a adolescent and teenager, you tend to think that nothing bad's ever going to happen to you. And that was my mentality. And that's exactly what happened. I, I had the worst thing possible happen to me. I, I end up taking somebody's life and now I have to deal with those consequences. So I've been my entire life since that point of getting released, talking to the youth and, and high schools and middle schools and college athletics, uh, working in corporate America to tell people that drunk driving is something that you can prevent. You know, every, every 53 minutes, somebody's killed by a drunk driver in this country. That's something that could be prevented. Yeah. And another piece of that, and, and this ties into the mental health, is once I opened up about my depression and my suicidal ideations and attempts, I started getting all these students to talk to me after, after my events. And it clicked. Like, then you start doing the research and the numbers and you see that at any given point in time, 20% of the population is dealing with a mental health problem. So yeah. one in four, one in five people that you see in an office building, in a classroom, they're struggling. And when I was going through it, I thought I was the only person. And then when you start talking about it, you start to hear that other people are going through the same things, just different, different situations, but they're feeling the same pain. And when, that, when I realized that, that's when I wanted to step out and, and start talking about this because everybody's so scared to talk about mental health. They're so scared to talk about depression. They're so scared to talk about suicide. It's tough. Yeah. It's, it, it, it's scary. Right. Um, I think especially as you're navigating a world as a teenager um, through your recovery, um, can you talk a little bit about the role that forgiveness played? Yeah. So this was a, uh... You know, I was looking at the questions this morning and forgiveness was something I struggled with for a very, very long time. And I don't think I really forgave myself until February of 2018 when I spoke at Resurrection Christian High School up in Fort Collins in Loveland area. And a moment that took place after the event up there was, was a day I'll never forget that kind of just gave me this sense that it was okay that I have this career and I'm speaking and I'm helping people and just kind of this weight was lifted off my shoulders of you're forgiven you're doing the right thing keep keep pushing and this is really my purpose and up until that point I've been struggling with the whole concept you know you have people 
oh, you get to travel all over the country. You get to work with all these amazing people. But why, why do you get to do that after what happened to you and all that pain you caused? And that would weigh on me. And I struggled with it. But February of 2014 is, is when it all kind of just disappeared. And things for my speaking career just started to blossom after that because it was, it was kind of just this sense of relief. And, yeah. and now I have this fulfillment of what I'm supposed to be doing. Yeah. Kind of follow up on that. I find it in my life. I think it's sometimes harder to forgive ourselves than it is other people. Why, why, why is it, can that be sometimes? I think it has to do with accountability and choices and decisions. Two things that I talk about in my speeches. I think it's really hard for people to forgive themselves because deep down they know they could have made a choice that altered the rest of their future. So if they're dealing with something and, and self-forgiveness is not happening, it's because they unconsciously know that there's something that they could have done to change that situation around and they just didn't make the right choice. And for me, that's kind of how I saw it is leading up to the night of the accident, there were four college basketball programs I failed out of before that, that could have changed my life and turned me from drinking and partying. So I had all these opportunities before that where I could have stopped. And if I would have addressed my mental health in eighth grade or in my senior year or the rest of the time in college, I might not have been drinking to die every day. Yeah. So I think that piece of that self-forgiveness took me for so long because I knew deep down inside I had all these opportunities to stop and I couldn't. Gotcha. The I've shared on other podcasts my 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 own struggles with depression in my late twenties. It was a different journey, um, but one of the things I had to kind of figure out, and I'd love to hear kind of um, at least I, I was a, a football player, you know, some of that machismo wired in you through through sports. Um, this idea of talking to other people about your problems. Um, and then this other idea that I struggled with was um, that I think made my struggles initially worse was this idea of self-love and how can we, you know, love ourselves for our uniqueness. Um, why is there nothing wrong with, with some self-love and some self-care? Well, I, I kind of attribute all this stuff to social media now. Sure. Comparison. Oh, it's, like, yeah. People have a hard time loving themselves because they see somebody on Instagram or Facebook living this amazing life, like taking these wonderful pictures and traveling or, and you look at that and you go, why am I not doing that? Why are they better than me? Why are they, you know, more influential, like impacting others more than I, cause I, I, I've struggled with it just from the social media aspect as well. And so for a, middle school, high school, college athlete, like loving yourself when you see all these other people succeeding and what you think they're succeeding in, that's, that's devastating to your confidence. And so I think that's a big part of why you're not able to love yourself is because we have all this influence of all this supposedly perfect lives that are around us. Yeah, I think it's social media, I mean, just puts comparisons in the palm of your hand, right? Um, in, in how we learned how to navigate and deal with that, uh, can, you know, have lasting effects, have some long-term things. Um, like I kind of touched on as an athlete, I, when I went through my struggles, I searched for other athletes that went through similar things. And then I realized I wasn't alone. And then, uh, eventually a friend challenged me that I should share my story cause it might help someone, but that took maybe three years four years. Um, why do we become so good at hiding our struggles? I think athletes in particular, when we can go about business, maybe on the court and, and be a leader and a teammate, but then off the court be isolated in a mess. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it has to do with just the whole competitive nature of sports. And especially as men we're we're told not to show any weakness and when you're, you have an ankle injury or you have a hurt rib or whatever it may be, you really want to play. So you're not going to, you're not going to tell the coach, coach, man, I can't play. I got a sore ankle. 
uh, I'm just not feeling it today. If you're a true competitor, you're going to play through broken bones and everything you can to do to be on that, that field or that court. And I think that piece of the mental health is, is, is built in, especially athletes where we don't want to talk about those weaknesses because we're going to end up losing our job as a, whatever, what position you play. Sure. You know, you're going to lose your job to somebody else who's not struggling. And you see it all the time. I mean, you think of the greatest quarterback of all time, Tom Brady doesn't get to play until, until Bledsoe goes down. And so everybody has that built in thing of we shouldn't show weakness because if we do, we're going to lose our position on the field. We're going to lose our position on the court. And, and so when it comes to mental health, you talk about that, you're going to be stigmatized. You're going to have people looking at you that are going to think that there's something wrong with you. And the reality is like we've talked about before, everybody's struggling with something at some point yeah. and just be open. Yeah. I think the, uh, the openness leads to, to the next step. I don't know what that is for, for each person, but um, once I became more open, at least it, uh, it helped shed more light where there was light. Um, speaking of light, what are some tools that you utilize? I know you mentioned your faith earlier. What are some things you utilize on a daily basis um, to keep your mind in the direction that you want it to be? Yeah. So even though I'm old and 40 and out of shape and can't play basketball anymore and I got herniated discs and all this type of stuff, uh, working out is my go-to. Uh, I still have to go to the gym and lift weights or uh, get on the elliptical and get my, my blood pumping. Um, part of my routine every day is doing push-ups when I get up in the morning. And yeah. those types of things keep me grounded in, in not only my physical, but also my mental health. And I do a lot of praying. I'm not religious, but I pray that I know there's something out there that's helped protect me. Whatever religion sure. or spiritual belief somebody may have, I just believe that, you know, I should have died that night in an accident. And mm -hmm. I'm walking, I'm breathing. I have to appreciate every day I have. And I, I really just pray to say thank you. And Another thing that I've been doing a lot lately is meditation. Um, yeah. I, I try to meditate 10, 10 minutes a day. I use a couple of the apps, but just the older I get, the more I realize like I, I need to focus on what's actually going inside of my head versus acting on impulse all the time. Cause that's what used to get me in trouble. Sure. Me as well. Um, the meditation, uh, is there something throughout your practice, that's been something I've been doing for a little over four years. Uh, through, through your practices or something that like, as you got into it, that you started to see more tangibility in your life from? Uh, I think, I think what I've noticed over the last year is just um, more of a sense of calm. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have the extreme highs and lows that I, I used to have. And is there a direct correlation to meditation? I don't know. But for me, that's what it seems like just because it, it gives me a sense of peace and shuts down my brain for a little bit because, you know, I, I know on my end, I'm constantly thinking about work, constantly thinking about how can I help these kids? How can I help somebody else? And my, my mind's running a million miles a minute. And meditation has been that like, okay, I get 10 minutes. I'm still, I don't have four years behind me like you, but it's over this year, I've gotten better and better at it. And, and I just kind of feel a little more at ease. Yeah. And I don't, yeah, it's, I don't know if I'm just better at it. <laughs> it's like, it's, but it's, it, it, it's a tool. And I think I, it's, it's, you know, um, the more I've used that tool, the more I've seen other positive effects, yeah. I guess. Um, Here, Here's one that uh, I've been doing a long, long time is jour journaling. Yeah. And my journaling, when I first started, it was writing rhymes and poems. Cool. And cool. So I actually have like thousands of rhymes and poem books written. Um, but it was more of a, a cathartic release for me to get all this anger and hostility and depression out on the page. And then I'd usually feel better. 
Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I've gone back to it now just to get my thoughts out on paper because it, it helps. Uh, unequivocally, I, I think, I think for myself, um, one, I think as someone that as an athlete, I wish I would have used it more because of some of the emotion. And now that I've found that, Hey, sometimes when you just put it on paper, it's out of you. Um, you kind of, it, it, it's got a, a freeingness to it. And I think the other really neat thing I try to at least talk with student athletes was you don't see it on maybe the days you write it, but being able to look back at how far you've come, uh, especially as a young, young person, that's just go, 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 um, is one of the reasons I recommend it. Cause I think that's one of the most, that's some of the reward for me is, uh, flipping through the end of a journal or something and, and remembering how you handled things. And, um, so I love that you brought that up. Uh, it's a great, great one to try. There's no wrong way to meditate. And there's no wrong way to journal. So, uh, I think that's one of the best things about you just start and you be you and, and let it flow from there. So, um, jumping into kind of student athletes and teammates that we might see or notice something different, they're struggling, uh, behavior change. What are some ways that we might be able to help those people in our life that if we kind of notice some things that they might be struggling with? Yeah. I, open the dialogue, have a conversation. I, I think that is the most important part, especially in a college and, and high school realm is if you see your teammates struggling, pull them aside and say, Hey man, what's, what's going on? I, I noticed that you're you're not as quick or as fast as you were last week. Are you struggling? Your grades are bad. You're, did you break up with your boyfriend or your girlfriend? Like those types of things weigh on, on somebody's mentality. And, you know, I, I, I can probably assume when you grew up as well as I did that your coaches would always tell you, leave everything on the court, you know, your personal life. It, it don't bring it to the court. Don't bring it to the field. Right. And the reality is, there's very few people that can shut that off and, and compartmentalize it to where I can go to a practice for two hours and not think about my family life. But the reality is a lot of people can't. So they're dealing with it on the court. So if you see that happening, open that dialogue and, and show trust. I, I think that's a key to it too, is just to show trust and say, Hey, I know you're going through something. I'm here. If you need me, if you're afraid to talk to somebody else, and it might not work the first one time, two times, but eventually you'll start to break down that wall and that vulnerability will come out because they, they see that you care because you keep asking, you know, and there's yep. obviously there's a delicate balance of not doing too much, but sure. it's just open that, that conversation. Yeah. Uh, for you, was there after kind of the, the accident, was there a conversation that kind of that you remember with someone that, helped, I don't know, get, get you thinking differently? Uh, honestly, no. no. Um, I've had a lot of amazing conversations, but not in that moment, <laughs> not in that moment. Like, I, I, I mean, people always ask me, well, how do you keep from drinking? Well, I took an innocent person's life. Like if that doesn't stop you from drinking, there's definitely something wrong with you. Yeah. And so I've never had that conversation of how to change. It just kind of, it was almost like a, you know, a snap in my, my brain where I was like, okay, I got to change. Now it hasn't been easy. I still yeah. struggle every day, just like everybody else. But I have that memory in those pictures of the accident. I have all the paperwork that I check out and read anytime that I start to get complacent with my life. I, I go and, and use that as a reflection point. And it's hard to even have those conversations with people because there's not a lot of people that experience what I went through. Um, and so it's hard to have that, that conversation about that, but I've had a lot of really good conversations with people that help other people. It's just, sure. you know, an accident like mine, that's, that's a, it, it, it was just like a light switch. Sure. I appreciate uh, your willingness to share, be open and vulnerable. I know that's what makes uh, you amazing speaker. Uh, hopefully if you're listening to this podcast, you get that opportunity uh, in the future. It's some time to hear Ethan speak. Uh, accountability. I think when it comes to even athletics, where it comes to things we're struggling with, 
once we even get past that openness, perhaps sometimes it's uh, that accountability factors it shortly follows. Uh, why does accountability get such a negative connotation uh, when it's really helpful? And do you think that's for our generation to change or do you think the kids are starting to change that themselves? Um, I see like, as part of my speech, I actually hand out accountability bracelets to student athletes and cool, I have cool. them give, give them out to teammates who are slacking so that they hold each other accountable. Right. I don't know if, if our generation really had the, and maybe it was just me and it might've been where I didn't have people pushing me. I was self-driven. Um, and so I didn't have somebody always saying, Hey fish, you got to do this. You got to do that. Like when I went through college, it was like, all right, you're on your own. You've got friends, but they're going to do their own thing. You're going to do your own thing. And, and I think it, a big peace of mind though was what was neglected is just because I was such a party or nobody really wanted to be around me um, from the athletics world. And that's what I missed. But um, can you, I, it cut off a little bit in between. So what sure. was the second piece? Yeah. Uh, I was saying that being around kids as much as you are as well. Um, do you think that the youth that you see will kind of change I know you're, you, the bracelets are, are one way to start that, right? Um, but that was my other thing is I think sometimes I see student athletes that have spot, spotted issues in our generation and they've started to take some things upon themselves, whether it's being more open about mental health in certain schools. And, and there's a lot of different, man, in some of the high schools, man, it's, it's a lot more easy to talk about things than it was in my day um, that, that you can just see, which is amazing. Uh, but do you think uh, this generation will kind of put a more positive spin on accountability? Yeah, I do. Um, I think that's the positive all, of all the social media. If you're using it right, you have the ability to help tens of thousands of people when in our generation, you could only impact the people in your school. Sure, you know, sure. it was so hard. And last week I actually did a podcast with a student uh, a college student that saw me speak and he started a podcast to get the youth experience. And that for me was really awesome because he's starting his own change and being that change agent uh, and, and doing his part and knowing that social media and a podcast and he has the ability to impact a lot of people with his generation. Whereas, you know, you and I, it was a, it was a little bit different. And so I, I just, I think, I think there's a lot of individuals that have these platforms and they're starting to recognize that they can use it for a positive thing. And it's going to continue to grow, you know, from a, you know, we're talking about mental health. When I first started talking about mental health, nobody was really talking about it. And then just in the last five years, you have Michael Phelps talking about it. Now you have Kevin Love talking about it. Uh, Last night after the Clippers game, Paul George talked about the social media and the depression he was facing. And so now you're having these celebrities and athletes who are willing to talk about it. So I think that change, uh, you know, I'm almost riding on the coattails now because everybody's got this positive, you know, aspect of, hey, everybody's dealing with something, let's help them. And now you're getting more and more and it's, we're creating that snowball to help people just push on through it's exciting to see the move towards proactiveness. Um, I mean, I'm enthused because especially from the athletes, when you see those athletes come out that everyone, myself included as a kids, you know, put them on a pedestal, uh, think they're unbreakable, they're unshakable, but everyone's human. And, and like you said, I think, you know, the one in every four, one in every five, that includes your athletes just because you play sports and train a little more than maybe someone else does not make you perhaps, you know, indifferent to, I think, I think it makes you more susceptible due to the demands of being a student athlete myself. I think they're already tough as they are as a teenager, but I think competitive, even if it's competitive, whatever outside of sports, whatever activity you're into theater drama, there's competition there. It, it cranks it up. Um, you get to go to 
to a lot of high schools and speak and help so many, many people. Uh, if you could get in a time machine and go back and visit 16 year old Ethan, what's the one truth that you've learned along your journey that you'd want to tell 16 year old you? Uh, if I could rewind it maybe two years to 14, that, that middle school, that eighth grade year for me, cause that's, that's such a pivotal moment in my life. Um, I wish that I would have known that there were other people struggling like I was and had the, the strength and the resiliency to actually address these issues because I look at, and I'll never blame my drug and alcohol addiction on depression or all that stuff. But I think my life would be completely different if I would have handled that underlying issue of peer pressure and not wanting to live. And like I was 14 I didn't want to live. I hated life. I hated my parents. And I wish I could go back and tell myself, this is just a moment in time. It's nothing when it comes to the, the big picture of life. Like you're struggling. Everybody struggles. You're going to get through this. You're going to be able to survive this. It's not that bad. Yeah. And I think that would have drastically changed my entire life. Oh, yeah.